Wisconsinized coverage of Campaign 2014 is being brought to you by the Wisconsin Hospital Association. For over 90 years, a valued voice supporting Wisconsin hospitals in communities like yours. Wisconsin Eye coverage of the 2014 elections continues. We're interviewing Lisa Subek of Madison. She's a Democrat running in the 78th Assembly District. And Wisconsin Eye thanks the Wisconsin Hospital Association for making this interview possible. Uh, Lisa, welcome to Wisconsin Eye. Thank you, Steve. Let's see. Tell us first to give us the short overview of your bio and qualifications for the sure. 78th District. Sure. So I've spent my entire career working to make a difference in the lives of children, families, and women. Um, you know, I began my career in early childhood education and quickly moved into the social services once I had worked for some time at the Head Start and Early Head Start programs and it really opened my eyes to the needs of children and families in our communities. And through that work it really drove me into the public policy arena because I was working with individual families or individual women who faced immense challenges in their lives, challenges that I couldn't possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. And as I tried to work to help them individually, to advocate for them on that individual level, what I found was there were a lot of policies standing in the way, lots of hoops to jump through, lots of broken systems. And that really drove me into the public policy arena. I, I um, worked for NARAL Pro-Choice Wisconsin for a number of years. And in that role, I had the opportunity to work on women's health care, work on fixing some of our broken systems around access to health care, access particularly to reproductive health care. Currently in my day job, I work for United Wisconsin, where I work on a whole wide range of progressive policies and I also serve on the Madison City Council and on the City Council I've really been able to take it to that next level of not only advocating to change our policies but to making a difference. I've been able to actually change policies um, on women's health care, on access to services in our community, on how we do business in our community to ensure that we put the needs of people first. Um. What have the recent uh, initiatives of, of Governor Walker and the uh, Senate and the Assembly uh, in terms of revenue sharing, what's, he, what's been the impact on some of your issues uh, as, a, as a council member, Lisa? Sure, sure. So first off, I mean, any city um, or community relies on strong, high quality education. And certainly the changes in revenue and what happens with our revenue has impacted the budgets of our local school district. Mm -hmm. While the city doesn't govern those, it has an incredible impact on the people who we work for so it has an incredible impact on our community as a whole um, you know certainly we've seen less and less money coming into our local government we have seen tighter revenue caps on what we are able to spend or raise in taxes and fees and that's put great constraints on us we have been forced into a position where we have to keep trying to do less trying to do more with less and as we try to do that there is a breaking point at which we just can't stretch it any Anymore, and we really need to change how money comes back into our local communities from the state. Okay, let's talk about specific issues. Let's talk about private school vouchers and choice. They've gone statewide even with a cap of a thousand. If you're in the state assembly next session, what 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 would you recommend or what would you work for in terms of the future of choice, Lisa? Mm -hmm. Certainly one of the dangers of the voucher program is its impact on our public school system. Every child needs to have access to a really great education and the way to do that is through our public schools. The voucher system has started to dismantle that. It's taken money from our public schools and brought it directly into a private school system and we see moves and you know I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. We will see pressure to continue to move more and more money into that voucher program. I advocated strongly against it, um, testified at hearings against it, spoke out to legislators and organized within the community to oppose the most recent expansion of the voucher program. And certainly in the legislature, I will work to turn that ship around, to go should, back. To should it exist in the city of Milwaukee and Racine, or would you get rid of it entirely? You know, I would prefer that we that we reinvest the money that we spend in the voucher program in, Mo in Milwaukee County, in Racine, and statewide back in our public schools. We need to look at how we fund our public schools. Tony Evers, our state superintendent, has a great proposal to really revamp how we fund our public schools and ensure that they have adequate resources, and I would be supportive of going that route. Common Core's debate 
participated in the Capitol. Do you support those those new standards? You know, I do think the new standards are good. I've spent quite a bit of time looking at that, and I know that there's been an immense amount of debate. It makes sense to set standards, allow our local schools to develop their own curriculums to meet those standards, but standard, you know, standards just make good sense. The governor um, said, I'm not interested in the federal government's offer to, to expand uh, MA benefits, even though the feds will say we'd, we'd pay 100% of the cost for the first year or two. Wise decision or unwise decision? You know, I think it's a very unwise decision. Um, the governor made a decision to put his politics and his political career ahead, ahead of the needs of people. Um, you know, refusing to take that money meant that upwards of 80,000 people were kicked off their badger care coverage. You know, here we are at a time where we're looking at expanding our health care system. Mm -hmm. And just this morning, a study came out about Minnesota that indicated that Minnesota increased the number of people insured by 40%. 40% growth in insurance, and much of that, in fact, the vast majority of it was attributable to the expansion in Medicaid. When Walker kicked those individuals and families off Badger Care, the result was they were left without insurance. Certainly, he wanted to push them into the exchanges, but the exchanges are not designed for families like the ones I worked with when I worked in the homeless shelter system at the YWCA or with the low-income housing programs. Those are individuals who are barely making it. They might be at or slightly above the poverty line, but they don't make enough to afford coverage through the exchanges. That's exactly why the federal government offered that Medicaid expansion. And I think we made the wrong decision. It has a dramatic impact on the lives of real children and families in our community. So you're not impressed when the governor says, um, and this is his, his claim, um, uh, now everybody under the federal poverty guidelines is covered with health care in Wisconsin. You know, if he had accepted the, ex the, the Medicaid expansion, we could have done better than that. Okay. Um, recent uh, reaction to Judge Crabb's recent ruling uh, that the constitutional provision against same-sex marriage is unconstitutional, please? Yeah, I'm absolutely thrilled with, her, with um, Judge Crabb's decision. I spent the weekend um, hearing from friends and colleagues who finally, after many, many years, had the opportunity to get married legally in our state. And, you know, it's an issue of basic civil rights, but it's also an issue that impacts individual families, families that have been in committed relations some with children for many, many years. And how thrilling that we have finally um, reached a point where they have true equality. Budget issue, Department of Transportation, possible $650 million shortfall in the next two-year budget cycle. Uh, would you delay highway projects, or how, how would you plug that shortfall? Sure, so the Department of Transportation has come forth with a report with many suggestions in it. I think we should start exploring those as a starting point. However, I also think that we need to start looking at transportation as a whole. We need to think about things like rail to get around our state. We need to think about things like investing in public transit at the city level. I served on our Transit and Parking Commission, and we really suffered um, on our ability to offer for good, high-quality public transit because of cuts at the state and the federal levels. So I think we need to invest in those things and start reducing some of the demand on our roads as well. Um, you know, our, our roads and our travel by, by, by individual vehicles impacts not only the financial cost to our communities and to our state, but it also has an environmental cost. So I believe we can start to reduce some of those costs by investing in smart transportation solutions. Part of the task force recommendations that you alluded to included raising the gas tax, which I don't think has been raised since 2006, and uh, uh, telling the State Department of Transportation every time you and I renewed our driver's, uh, our vehicle plates, how many miles we've driven, and then a small surtax. Are those two things you could support? You know, I think they're both possibilities. The devil is always in the details, so I would need to see, the, see a bill that... Um, Ex that the, I, I would need to see a bill that explain more about what exactly those increases would be. But certainly I think there are possibilities. Both of those are things that also serve as incentives to perhaps choose alternate modes of transportation when possible, um, which is something that I always appreciate. The minimum wage and whether it should be uh, raised is being debated both here in our capital and in Washington. What's your, what's your position? I 100% support raising the minimum wage. When, How high would you take it? You know, I support Corey Mason's bill 
bill to raise, uh, Representative Cory Mason's bill to raise the minimum wage to 10 10 an hour, but I would be very happy to raise it all the way to $15 an hour, um, just as they did in Seattle, Washington on the local level, and I expect that other states and cities will begin to do. You know, I worked with families who lived on minimum wage jobs, and the reality is you can't make ends meet. You know, I saw families lose housing who were working 40 to 60 hours a week because they couldn't afford their rent on that. It just isn't realistic to keep the minimum wage so low, and that's certainly something that, as an advocate, I've been fighting for. Madison, many years ago, raised our own minimum wage before the rest of the state did. Mm -hmm. I worked on that campaign. I collected signatures. I worked tires tirelessly at that time for us to raise it to just over $7 an hour. And, you know, I think it's high time that we keep up with inflation, keep up with cost of living and raise the minimum wage statewide. One candidate for attorney general says first time, uh, first time uh, drunken driving should be a crime. Your position? You know, I think it's something that we need to look at the specifics of. You know, I think that first and foremost, we need to prevent drunk driving. And certainly, the information out there is mixed about whether making it a crime actually serves as a preventative measure. So I think, you know, it's a hard call and I would really need to dive even deeper into the information out there about the effect of criminalizing it. Um, you know, there, there are many reasons that my, ins there, there are many reasons why on instinct it seems like it just makes good sense. On the other hand, um, you know, we've looked at decriminalizing some other offenses, and so we might want to take a look at why do people drive drunk, are there ways that we can prevent it, and then look at criminalizing first offense drunk driving. Two final questions. Number one, I want to give you a chance to mention any of any other major campaign issue that I haven't asked about. Anything there? Sure. You know, certainly um, we've seen incredible changes at the state level in many arenas. One that's near and dear to me is the changes to women's health care. Um, you know, we have seen in the last few years the defunding of Planned Parenthood. We've seen a bill that would require that women get an ultrasound before they're able to have an abortion, no matter what the circumstances of their pregnancy. Um, we've seen bills that roll back our comprehensive sex ed law that I worked so hard to pass just a couple of years ago. We've seen proposals that would limit access to birth control on the state level. And those are all things I've spent much of my career working to expand. And so certainly I think those are key issues that I would go to the legislature and that not only do I have the not only not only do I have the right views on those, but I have the experience and the knowledge to be able to go in there to share stories, to be able to talk about the very real impact that those decisions have had on the lives of women in our communities, and to be able to make real change. And finally, I want to give you a chance, uh, if you choose to uh, uh, to do it, to, to highlight any differences between you and Mr. Clear, who is your primary opponent. Sure. Well, I mean, certainly, I'm the only candidate in this race who has. Had had experience making real change, um, making a difference in people's lives at the local level, the state level, and even on the national level. And I think that experience is something that I would bring with me. When I talk to residents out in the district, whether it's at a community event or when I go out and knock on their door, one of the things that I most frequently hear is we want somebody who can be not only progressive and not only represent our strong progressive values, but who can be effective. And I've had that experience, making a difference, passing laws on the local level, on the state level, and even in a smaller way on the national level. And I will bring that experience to the state capitol and represent our progressive district very well. Thank you. Lisa Subek of Madison is a Democratic candidate in the 78th Assembly District. The primary is August 12th. Lisa, thanks for stopping in at uh, Wisconsin Eye. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.